Hello, everyone, and welcome to Microsoft Mechanics Live. Today, we've got a special show in store. Ask me anything, or actually ask Mark anything. Mark Krasinovich is with us, the CTO of Azure. Give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Always great to have you on, Mark. Always so, fun to be on. We've got some, we've got some people in the, in the crowd with microphones. We've got Matt McSpirit also is going to be fielding questions. But we want to we wanna actually start out with, with your questions and a couple of things that we thought about in terms of topics that we can answer. Hold on, let me go back. Uh, we've got a few things here. And, and vote for the ones that you like the most. Azure architecture, what do you think? Yes. Any of you? <laughs> All right. Azure confidential computing, something brand new. OK, that one's, that one's not as good as architecture so far. Uh, Cocoa Framework and, and blockchain. I think that one's winning so far. Protecting against cyber criminals. All right. That's a popular one. And serverless. Sys internals tools. <laughs> All right, it's clear we have a winner. OK, so why don't we start out with somebody? Does anybody have a question with Sys internals tools? This gentleman here in the stripes. For 100. Hello, Mark. It's an honor to meet you finally. Uh, quick question about uh, memory dump when debug. Uh, read some of your books, some of the articles, a lot of blogs, but I haven't found so far anything that leads from A to B, introducing all the concepts, the terms, to understand and, and be able to analyze to determine you know, bug check or uh, uh, system hang reason, you know, cause. Yeah. Is there anything that you would recommend or, or a path that someone should take to understand the whole concept and, you know, terminologies and everything regarding that? Yep. Thank I've, you. I've got just the thing for you. It's called Windows Internals. It's a two book uh, volume set. So uh, you can get, either get the sixth edition or the seventh edition. Volume one's come out for the seventh edition. And actually, uh, the part on bug checks in the seventh edition is not out because it's in the second volume. So if you get sixth edition, there's a whole chapter on crash dump analysis. And then all the concepts, of course, that lead up to you really having a deep understanding of what's in a crash dump, that's the rest of the book. So in a half an hour, you should be all set. So, so just to summarize, uh, anything that has the end-to-end -end kind of process in terms of crash dump analysis, get the Windows internals books. Yeah, and actually I've been, uh, so more a, simple, a simpler approach to crash dump analysis just for seeing if the dump can give you some clues. I, in my case in the explain talks, always have a section on crash dumps. And in the past, at tech eds before that became Ignite, I've done full sessions on crash dump analysis that kind of crash dump analysis without having to be an expert on Windows internals. All right, any other questions on sys internals tools? Blue top. Somebody got a mic for him? All right, we're going to grab you a mic. Hi, Mark. Uh, quick question. Sys internals tools, are, how are you coping them now that you're supporting Linux systems and Linux subsystems? Is there anything in there that's going to help us analyze what could potentially go wrong with that? Yeah, so great question. I have not put any specific support in for Linux subsystems or even containers, but Process Explorer is a tool that I've got a bunch of to-dos on my list to actually expose what's going on inside those things. And actually, uh, another related to Linux, you're going to see the release of the first sysinternals tool for Linux. Actually, make that the second, because I released FileMon for Linux back in 2001. Uh, that became obsolete after a while, but we're really going to be releasing a proc dump for Linux shortly. It kind of has the same basic feature set as proc dump for Windows. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. And to, so to Thank give you. people to answer, give people a bit more info in the question, all around sysinternals and Linux, some cool stuff coming down the line. But we're going to move on from sysinternals tools now. We're going to go back to the main view. What do we think was second highest? Was it the protecting it against cyber, cyber criminals? criminals was yeah? second, yeah. Okay, who's got some questions around protecting cyber criminals? This hand went straight up. I'm Mark. So we're uh, heavily invested in Azure right now. Uh, multiple tenants, multiple subscriptions across the board. Um, what is your vision for kind of aggregating all of those data points um, into OMS and uh, Security Center, but actually 
shipping that out to a sim or some sort of focal point so that our sock doesn't have 20 places to look at? Yeah, so great question. Our vision actually is that uh, Azure Security Center is the one-stop shop for security. OMS are basically management capabilities on top of that core security capability that comes with Azure Security Center. And a goal from the start has been whatever data is collected by those systems is your data. So you can point those data streams at wherever you'd like. And we imagine many people are going to point them at some place where they're going to maybe use Splunk, for example, to go take a look at it, or an on-prem sim that's aggregating events from their on-prem environment and the cloud environment. So that should be, that's possible today for you to be able to do that. Uh, if it's not, you know, send me an email and I'll figure out what's uh, short for you. Thank you. Yeah, more questions. Who wants to ask more about protecting against cyber criminals? Come on, hands up. Here's one again at the front. How you doing, Mark? Hey. Um, hey, my question is, over the last 20 years, uh, threats have evolved from people seeking glory to general disruption to now extortion. Uh, where do you see it going in the future? I think that we're going to see just all more of the same of all of this. In fact, uh, this is great opportunity for me to plug my book because each one of the books, how many people have read any of the books, by the way? So a few of you. So each one of the books I took is different kind of threat actor and really drilled into what their world looks like. In the first one, it's just somebody that wants to do harm or damage. In the second one, it's state-sponsored cyber espionage. In the third one, it's malicious insiders aimed at financial gain. So I didn't really have the extortion exactly, but you can see that it's a morphing of several of those threat actors. Uh, I think um, you know, where things are going, it is just you're going to see more action by each of these threat actors, it just, this, just you know, the stories and the amount of focus and our amount of dependence on cyber, secure and on, on cyber systems means that you're going to just see more and more different attackers uh, trying to make gains in whatever way they define it. Great answer. So one more question on protecting against cyber criminals. Anybody got one? Perhaps over there, a yeah, guy in the gray shirt there. Are there any good recommendations on um, inventory management in Azure to keep track of everything that's, that you have out there? Yeah, so uh, inventory management. So first, we designed Azure Resource Manager to be the one-stop shop for inventory. Uh, the OMS, of course, that's another way to look at specific kinds of inventory, specifically your virtual machines. I think you're going to see richer capabilities to look across subscription coming. Uh, because that's many companies have multiple subscriptions, so being able to aggregate that view, and actually you can already do that in OMS, but uh, also taking a look at not just virtual machine resources, but native Azure resources that are native to Azure Resource Manager. That will be aggregated up in, into these overall views. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's move on to another topic. I think uh, confidential computing and trusted execution environments, something that Mark and I are both passionate about. So yeah. anybody got questions around trusted execution environments, shielded VMs, et cetera? No question. Everybody knows how they work? Somebody over there. Oh, there's some questions out to the side here. So if you are uh, trying to encrypt, how will you secure the execution of the CPU? Because in the CPU, you can read it because there's unencrypted. How will you fight that? Well, so uh, this is a reference to uh, technology that uh, kind of the first commercial implementation of a trusted execution environment built on hardware is Intel's SGX, or Software Guard Extensions, which showed up in their Skylake consumer processors. We're the first public cloud to offer SGX in our cloud servers. And so the question is, what does that protect against and what it doesn't? And so as the instructions and the data gets processed by the CPU, it is in the clear, but that's protected by the CPU package itself. So it's very difficult to get a, uh, something like an in-circuit emulator up and actually see that data as it goes through the CPU. The caches are encrypted, the memory is encrypted, so this is uh, really the state of the art when it comes to a black box for security. And how does that work in terms of when we are actually running and, and we have access in, in terms of getting to the VMs and the disks that are running the VMs, how does that um, obfuscation work then? Well, so this, with this trusted execution environment and this capability we've got in Azure, a customer can choose to use basic raw SGX capabilities on their own. 
and SGX is exposed into the virtual machine types that we operate on these servers, that gives you the ability to put code inside those enclaves and then have those enclaves attest to the fact to you that they are actually running in SGX enclaves and that they're running the code and configuration that you've provisioned in them. And at that point, you've tr you can establish trust with that, and then you can deploy secrets into it. Those secrets are completely oblivious to us, and the data that it might be processing in the clear based on decrypting data that comes out of your store, your disks, for example, is completely oblivious to us. So you get basically Microsoft out of the trust loop. We can't, our operators, our administrators can't access it. Malicious insiders can't access it. The uh, government can't come and get us to give them your decrypted data. They've got to get you in the loop on that because we don't have the keys to that data. So this is uh, really the beginning of a new era in cybersecurity that we believe we're launching with this capability in the public cloud. Mm -hmm. So that, now what we're going to be doing is building support into some of our services directly. In fact, if you come to my 4 o'clock session on data center internals, you're going to see me do a demonstration of what we consider SQL always encrypted vNext, which allows the SQL query processor to run inside of an SGX enclave where your data from your SQL encrypted columns can be processed with rich queries and yet not be accessible outside that enclave by the SQL administrator that might be sitting on that server, by somebody that has direct access to the hardware, again, malicious insiders. And so that gives you an extra capability for confidential SQL in the cloud. Awesome. Yeah, it's cool stuff. And it's really powerful that we're working so closely with our hardware partners to really unlock the most secure platform. So uh, when we think about cyber criminals, we thought about uh, confidential computing. What's next on our topic list, do you think, Jeremy? Where do you think we should go? Blockchain I'm or serverless? In, let's, do the, uh, let's do the blockchain stuff and, and Cocoa Framework. Yeah, so how many people have heard of blockchain? I joked about this in the Azure Stack session. Blockchain has reached a point in the hype cycle where it's basically, the answer is blockchain. What was the question? <laughs> so it's really, uh, but in fact, we're actually moving into a place where people are starting to understand the practical places that they can deploy blockchain. And of course, for those of you not uh, familiar with blockchain, it's also known as distributed ledger technology. As opposed to SQL, which is a centralized ledger or database, a blockchain is distributed with multiple parties all participating with nodes that maintain a consistent view of the data in the blockchain. If you're familiar with Bitcoin, of course, that's the most popular uh, consumer-facing uh, blockchain focused on cryptocurrency. But we're seeing enterprises wanting to adopt it for richer scenarios. Uh, one of the blockchain technologies that's also public is called Ethereum. That's not aimed at cryptocurrency, although there's a cryptocurrency involved with fueling an Ethereum block, public Ethereum blockchain network. But it's aimed really at what are called smart contracts or distributed applications that can operate on the blockchain. And people look at this and see a whole world of opportunities to get rid of friction and middlemen and get rid of inconsistencies that different parties have with respect to data, which is a big challenge when you've got multiple parties that are each maintaining their own views of the state of the world. What we're doing in, in Azure is trying to make it very easy for people to stand up blockchains either as proof of concepts or even in production that are integrated with Azure services that are required for you bas basically to have enterprise management, like identity, monitoring, key secret management. And one of the breakthroughs that we believe that we've got here is something called the Cocoa Framework. I just talked about trusted execution environments. Well, one of the challenges, or a couple of the challenges with the blockchains that are out there, including Ethereum, is that the mining or the consensus protocols for ev all the members to decide what's a consistent view are based on proof of work, where they're each trying to solve cryptographic puzzles to prove that they've got an investment in the answer. And the winner of the cryptographic proof puzzle is, gets the honor of minting the next block in the blockchain. That's a giant waste of energy, and it also limits the throughput of these blockchains, as well as the latency of transactions on these blockchains. Another problem with the public blockchains is that everything you do is effectively in the clear. So the Ethereum smart contracts are in the clear. And they have to be, because each member needs to be able to rerun the contract to validate that it's act actually doing something legitimate. And so this is the way that the network establishes that people aren't trying to game the system. And then the final problem with public blockchains that you apply to consortium environments is 
the management of the constitution or the rules for who's part of the consortium network, what kind of versions of the software do we approve in the version network. We call that the, the blockchain constitution. And the COCA framework is not a ledger by itself. It's a, a capability, basically a, a framework that sits on top of trusted execution environments where each participant in a consortium network runs their node, and their node can, has to prove to the other nodes using that attestation I talked about earlier that it's running a version of the blockchain code with the constitution that the consortium agrees on. And once they agree on it, they know that that code will sit in the enclave and protect the secrets, protect the smart contracts and other data that needs to be confidential from leaking outside. And that allows confidential confidentiality for blockchain transactions. It also allows for a, a programmatic constitution because each node is executing according to the rules that have been programmed into it, and everybody trusts that. It also unlocks very low latency and high throughput because the nodes all trust each other because they trust the code and they trust the, ex the enclaves inside them. And we're integrating right now Ethereum blockchain onto Cocoa Framework. So that proof of work goes, Ethereum gets confidentiality properties, and then there's also constitution management. So that's, I think, a big breakthrough. We've seen a lot of interest by lots right. of different companies in, in let's that. Do one, let's do one more topic. We've got a few on, on, on the board here. Let's go with serverless. That's something that I think a lot of people are thinking where compute is going, right? Because it's yeah. kind of platform agnostic to some extent. Anybody, anybody have a question on serverless in the back here? There's a question right over there and one at the back there as well. Should we go to the quick, the shortest one first, and then we'll go to the one first? All right, we'll there. go to the back. Do you want to so. come in a little bit closer? Hold on, the microphone's coming to you, sir. I didn't, I went shorter as in distance. There we go. In. Hey, uh, so, um, I was actually wondering if you were going to start bringing some of the OMS and Azure automation services down to Azure Stack and start getting some of that serverless automation and management of some of those workloads? So automation isn't the equivalent of serverless. And as far as Azure automation's roadmap getting on Azure Stack, I don't have anything to share with you at this point in time. But let me talk a little bit about what serverless is and where we see this going. Serverless, the industry accepted definition for serverless is that it has to meet three characteristics. One of them is that it's serverless, and serverless doesn't mean there's no servers. Obviously, there's servers someplace. But what it means is that it's auto-scaled automatically, and where you don't have to see the servers, you don't have to manage the servers, you don't have to patch the operating system, that's all handled for you. You just worry about the piece of code. The second characteristic is that it's event-driven. And so you're going to see a lot more event-driven architectures in the cloud. Really, this is kind of the renaissance for event-driven programming that you've got now in the cloud. And event-driven means that some action that you specify is what triggers your code to execute. And that could be uh, something showing up in your Azure storage account, or a new user showing up, and a new customer showing up in your CRM database, or a message that comes from an IoT device. And the third characteristic is that it's micro-build, which means that you only pay for this resources consumed as your code runs in response to an event, as opposed to paying for a virtual machine that sits there all the time. We actually believe that serverless is the future of cloud computing, and it really demonstrates, I think, already with some of the serverless offerings we got, things you can do in the cloud that you can't do on premises. My example that I show, it's a great demonstration, is using Logic Apps, which is our integration serverless workflow service, where the scenario is, it's common to everybody here, a company that wants to monitor social media, see, detect, see tweets about them, determine if they're positive or negative. If they're negative, then email with the customer. So this is something that is really simple to set up in Logic Apps as opposed to the traditional IT architecture, which would probably take weeks to architect, weeks or months to deploy, and then you've got a maintenance issue. With Logic Apps, you can go to the visual designer and using the workflow in what we call connectors, drop in an event that says, trigger this logic app when there's a tweet about my company. Then when there's a tweet about my company, take the Twitter handle or take the text, pass it to sentiment analysis, cognitive API, which comes back with a score. If it's below a certain threshold, look up the username in the CRM database to see if they're a customer of ours. If they are, see if I've emailed with them more than a few times. That means that I'm personally engaged with them. And if so, send myself an email 
reminding myself to follow up with this customer that includes the body of the tweet, the username, their Twitter handle, and the sentiment score. And all of that is you know, 10 steps in Logic Apps, no code involved at all. And once you deploy it, it's an Azure Resource Manager template underneath. I can deploy it to different regions. It automatically scales out. So if there's 5,000 tweets in a second, a Logic Apps will scale out to execute my, that Logic App workflow 5,000 times with very low latency in, in an SLA. And I can check the template into source control. So this is kind of, I think, a great example of serverless and the power of serverless. Where we're seeing it go is not just event-driven architectures, but also long-running application architectures. And our first step in that direction is something called Azure Container Instances, which how many people have heard of Azure Container Instances? Raise your hands. This is you something have a, relatively new. You have a show new. on it with Corey Sanders oh, you did, in just yeah. a couple of hours. Oh, you've got a show on it? OK, yeah. so come by and see Corey talk about it. But this is a service we released in preview just a few weeks ago. This is, you can think of a serverless containers, where you can basically say, I want to run this container in Azure. You don't specify virtual machines. You don't specify OS configuration. You just say, here's the container image. And boom, you go. And we take care of the rest. And you pay for only the time that that container is executing. All right, so we got one last question. You don't have to uh, use the scoreboard here, but any, any other topic? We had First person guy, to raise their hand. We had this gentleman time. over here patiently waiting. Oh, he, waiting, was, he was patiently so waiting. I'm sorry. Probably go to him. <laughs> <laughs> one last quick question. OK, so my question was about migration. So what about moving from lambdas to functions? Because first of all, I started two months ago to migrate some things from Amazon to Azure. And the biggest issue was I could not up upload zips containing node modules, for example. I had to go to the CLI, reinstall the modules, put them in different locations. And that is a little bit of overhead compared to, to the Amazon, how, how it works. Just choose this, the zip that you've compiled on the local machine, then upload it and test it easily. So that specific question I'm not sure about the answer to. I thought that you could put NPMs inside or n node packages inside of the zip file. But if you can't, send me an email and I'll follow up and figure out what's going on with that. All right, so thank that you. was the last question. So everybody thank Mark Rasinovich for his right. time. And Thanks, everybody. And, AMA. <laughs> and of course, stay tuned to Microsoft Mechanics for all the updates. We're going to be posting this to the web. So we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.